Andy. Thank you, Ian. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I am a webinar uh, virgin, so please be gentle with me in the chat. Um, I'll do my best and we'll see how we go. Um, what we've done, as Ian said, is we've looked at the list of requests that people asked for and then split that down so that tonight is very much about the bit, the nuts and bolts, the how to, the things that you should be considering doing either before you start your backcountry career um, or things you should do to further your backcountry exploration and the sort of knowledge that you need to have. And hopefully it will prompt you to maybe go do some further learning or it might even be a confirmation that you know something and that you're, you're quite happy with that. It might also start a conversation with your skiing partners, friends, family, etc. Sorry, I should rewind and say, um, when I say skiing, I meant riding. It could be on, it could be on a snowboard, it could be on skis. I'm old and programmed to say ski when I mean to say snow sport. So apologies for that. I must also apologize that my library of photos is very one-sided and I haven't got many snowboarding or splitboarding photos in my repertoire. So that's my new year's resolution will be to actually go snowboarding and, and touring when we're allowed to with Leslie and she can educate me about everything splitboarding. Um, all the photos that we've got tonight are pretty much, I've tried to keep them to Scotland. Now, obviously, we're talking about backcountry in Scotland, but there's also backcountry everywhere in the world. So everything we're going to talk about tonight is applicable to your journeying and touring and backcountry adventures anywhere in the world. And that's what we'll do. Any questions, fire them into the chat and we'll try and address them. And we'll also try and send out some further resources, but we'll do that separately at the end. OK, here we go. So um, we're going to talk about going in the back country. And this is actually I know this is a ski area, but the ski area is closed and this little group are skinning through it in order to go touring or exploring off the back. Now, when we go in the back country, we would, most people would normally go with somebody else or with a group. And within that group, there's going to be a pretty diverse range of personalities, character traits, whatever you want to call them. There are different people in that group. And we've got this bunch of youngsters here who are on a British free ride training camp. We've got the young lad that's full of excitement and it's bubbling over. We've got a couple of guys who are laughing along with the young guy that's got that's full of enthusiasm. And we've got the guy on the far left who doesn't look like he's enjoying himself, but he is. And within that group, it's that very, very different dynamic is what makes our touring days and our backcountry exploration interesting and exciting. It's what gives us strength and confidence to go further and challenge ourselves. But also, while it's giving us strength, it can also be a weakness. Do all four guys on the screen, are they capable of looking after an injured, injured boarder or, or skier? Are they capable of navigating themselves? Will they behave in the way that we, we want them to behave? And it's that human dynamic that is really, really important. And one that as an individual, we need to be aware of and tolerate and understand. So what sort of group size is ideal? And there's been a lot of research about the ideal group size to rescue a buried snowboarder, skier, rider, whatever, when they've been caught in an avalanche. And there are figures and statistics around the ideal number. Obviously, the group on the left is probably, most of us would agree, too big. 
there's too much different chat in that group. As they're skidding uphill, is every single person in that group looking at the conditions, looking at their friends, making sure that they're, they're doing okay, making sure that everybody is functioning the way we want them to. Within that large group, there's almost certainly going to have little cells, little leadership, little bits of mutiny that will happen within that group that will affect how decisions will be made, will affect whether the decisions made are safe, correct, good decisions, or whether they're influenced, biased decisions that lead us down onto slopes we don't want to go onto. The smaller group on the right hand side, you can almost certainly imagine the three, the three of them skinning along, having a good discussion. And maybe it's a little bit too personal in that discussion that they aren't actually exploring the subject wide enough. And in fact, they're staying on focused on one smaller topic. So what is the ideal group size? Too big is not good, too small is not good somewhere in the middle is about right. And I'm gonna afraid I'm gonna, I'm gonna shirk the responsibility of telling you what the size of a, a, the perfect group is, because I don't think it exists. But certainly if it's too big, there's differences. And if it's too small, there's also differences and problems. And I guess the question that we should address is, is it appropriate to go in the back country on our own? And I suppose if I wear my instructor hat, I would have to say, no, it isn't. You should go with a group, maybe hire a guide, maybe get some friends and go out in the backcountry. But I love skiing on my own. I love touring on my own. It's, it's, a, it's a, a, maybe a guilty pleasure, but I actually enjoy being out in the, the mountains and the, the wilderness on my own and I enjoy that so it would be a case of is it appropriate on your own if you're prepared to accept the risk that traveling on your own brings that you balance that against the terrain and the conditions and how you will behave yourself in the backcountry then yes skiing on your own is absolutely correct and can be a great thing to do as individuals, we have, we have needs, we have skills that we need to perfect and develop. We need to be good on our boards and our skis. So skiing on piste, continuing to go to a ski area and train and develop our skills. I certainly this year, I've not been able to travel as much and I haven't done as much skiing as I would normally do. And I feel quite rusty when I'm sliding about and I'm missing my hours of riding lifts and skiing slopes in order to get my body and brain connected to my skis. So I feel like I'm not really ready to push myself in the backcountry. And I very much enjoy the piece performance aspect of, of pushing myself and developing my technique so that I can ride safer, I can ride further with less effort, with more efficiency, and I can do that in a safer and more responsible way. We also have a, a whole range of off-piste techniques and knowledge that we need to perfect and practice. And these are things that we must continually revisit. So this is the companion rescue. So using your avalanche transceiver, using an avalanche probe, digging out a, a buried casualty, first aid, navigation is in there, general knowledge and experience of being on the mountains is important. And that doesn't have to be done only on snow. Summer hill walking is, is a vital element of that. And I guess it all comes down to how we manage ourselves and our group comes down to these three elements. It's the ambition, your ambition, the ambitions of your group your friends, the colleagues that you're riding with, are they very honest about what their ambition is? Or are they going to suddenly have a mid-mountain mutiny and divert the plan? What is their ability? What is your ability? 
are you skiing at the top of your game? I'm certainly not at the moment, so I feel quite quite cumbersome when I'm I'm skiing. Um, are they able to ride and and do so in a way that is safe for you and for them? Do you believe that what they you know you've always got to have somebody that's very vocal about how good they are on a pair of skis or a board, but is that actually genuine? Can they actually do, cut the mustard when they're on the hill? And finally, we've got to balance those ambitions and abilities against the conditions that we're presented with. If we get deep powder with no hazards, no obstacles, and plenty of room, then we can mitigate against poor ability and somebody that's over ambitious. If the conditions are challenging in terms of the environment or the snow or how wide the snow is as in the picture on the right we have to tailor the ambition and increase on the ability so within a group there is a huge amount of dynamics maybe going backcountry touring on your own is the simplest way to deal with that but it isn't as enriching as going with a group and we just need to be aware of what everybody where everybody is and what everybody wants to do i'm going to move that on and, and this is a chance for you to ask any questions and i guess leslie you've got maybe seen any chat that there is and um, so we we have a question um, and this comes from the current um restrictions and guidelines and um, max group size is currently two I presume that's in relation to the the rule for exercise um, with one other person. Um, is that correct? Who, who, James, James P, is that where you're coming from with that? Yeah, so um, I get that, that throws up an interesting question, Andy, and, and certainly one that I've thought about in the last few days lucky enough to have snow locally to, to go and exercise on and the choice to, to go out with one other person or the option um, because of the rule to go with one other person, definitely a consideration on where you're going to go and how your group dynamic of two is going to work. Do you want to speak a bit on that? Yeah, certainly, yes. I mean, I think so. Like when you go on your own, then you are responsible for your decisions. As soon as you add another member or multiple members, then you are balancing people's ambitions and desires. And as humans, we're, we're biased in how we perceive, perceive ourselves and how we perceive other people. If we believe that they're not doing something that is to our benefit, we will, without conscious thought, try to adjust that. Now, I think if you're going to go for a, a backcountry tour with one other person, as is, as in with the COVID restrictions, then the logic would be to have a very open and frank discussion with that individual. Hopefully there's somebody that you know very well, you know what their capabilities are, where their strengths are, and what their ambitions will be, and that you can find some common ground. Now, that might be that both parties have to compromise or one party has to comp compromise more than the other. But we should appreciate that in this current climate, being able to go out with another person is uh, a luxury as opposed to being locked down completely and unable to go to the mountains. But certainly one one to one is possibly one of those areas where a frank discussion will happen and those individuals will certainly discover and learn more about their friends and their partners than they would have done without COVID restrictions when they were allowed to tour in bigger groups. Does that answer that question? Absolutely. I, you know, I've, I can um, say a little bit maybe to, to highlight a, a bias that can be hidden and, and definitely um, perhaps a little bit tacit in a relationship where you know somebody really well. So often I'm going to touring with my partner and we, we, you know, we know each other really well. Um, 
but we still have miscommunication when we're on the mountain around ambitions, expectations, how to approach certain situations. And I'll give you a, a relatively funny anecdote from um, a couple of weeks or about 10 days ago. So when it first snowed and we, we wanted to go exploring and we had to cross a river and um, my partner had the bright idea to put bin bags over our snowboard boots to cross said river. Um, which was too wide to, to use the stepping stones. I wasn't really up for the bin bags, but the river wasn't deep. There was no danger involved in this situation. It was just going to be uncomfortable if we got wet and kind of a bit annoying. So I went along with it. And inevitably, when you go along with something, it usually doesn't work, does it? So I was the one that got the leaky bin bags and wet feet, cold, wet feet. Um, and that was that was the least of the problems. The problem there was actually the expectations and the communication and the fact that I hadn't gone, I don't want, I don't like that plan, I don't want to do it. Uh, and it, it really throws up a situation in a backcountry environment where you, you have to speak up and you have to be really clear about where your limits are and whether it's, you know, a situation where it's just soggy, wet, cold feet or a way more serious situation where you're out of your depth, either in what you're prepared to take on or your abilities to handle the conditions. I think it's important to take ownership of what you're, you know, what you're up for. And, you know, especially with people, you know, they, they can't read your mind. Although, you know, in, in many partnerships, I'm sure there are other people the same. You presume they can when you give them that look that says, I don't want to go through a river with bin bags on my feet, that they'll understand that, but sometimes you really have to say it. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Leslie. Should we we'll move on to the next subject or the next the next topic? So what to pack? Now this can be either a very short, quick question that we, and topic we're going to cover or this could become a very long and laborious one because what to pack is an incredibly personal thing. And um, I would certainly never go rooting around in somebody else's rucksack to find out what they carry. But there are some certain challenges that we have in the UK. Being surrounded by the sea, being as far north as we are, our weather is incredibly inclement and and we're known around the world as probably the harshest gear testing environment there is and some manufacturers embrace that willingly and some manufacturers steer well clear of the scots because we get wet we get covered in rime we get sweaty because we can't breathe so what we pack you know is or needs to be appropriate for the weather and the conditions. If, if I just move on to a pile of kit, this is, I emptied my rucksack this afternoon and took a picture. Obviously I didn't take my skis out of the rucksack, but they're there to show the importance of having color coordinated poles. Um, what I have on the floor there is, if you like my pick and mix kit, that I would take on the mountains. Um, it's important when we're trying to travel in the backcountry to keep our kit to a minimum because the bigger the rucksack, the heavier it is, the bulkier it is, the harder it will be for us to control its destiny while we're trying to ski and, and, and board around on the mountains. But on that list, on that sheet there, I have a variety of items that will always be in my rucksack and some that won't. So for instance, I don't go out the door without a transceiver, shovel and a probe, regardless of the avalanche condition. The shovel is an emergency tool that I, I can build a stretcher with. I can dig an emergency shelter. If I'm going to dig an emergency shelter, I need to know how deep the snow is. So I need a probe. The avalanche transceiver is there because we're, we're humans, we make mistakes. I would always travel with some form of emergency shelter, a bothy bag. Now, obviously, we can't share bothy bags with our 
one other ski touring or, or snowboarding partner, but we must have some form of shelter. The ice axe, the crampons, the ropes, they go in and out of my rucksack as my plans change and the conditions change. I would always have some form of repair kit. I would have multiple maps because I'm very prone to lose them. I suffer with cold hands, so I have lots of gloves. I have a hat fetish, so I have lots of bobble hats. I am old enough that I learned to ski without a helmet. I am not so old that I can't leave my helmet at home. So I have a love-hate relationship with a, with a helmet. At the moment, I think there's a few rocks around and I'm pretty keen to keep my head in one piece. So what I have on, on, in my rucksack is enough kit to cope with the, the vagaries of ski touring in Scotland. At this time of year, I have shortened daylight hours. So I'll make sure that I have a head torch to cope with late, a late off the hill. Or I might even choose to use a head torch in order to skin up to travel a bit further and I set off in the dark. I suppose the picture on the left is really to represent the, the funny peculiars that we can't factor in or we can't predict that will happen as they will happen. And the picture on the right is one of being, being self-sufficient and trying to repair your skis before you call for help. The Scottish Mountains. Sorry, the Scottish Mountains are incredibly accessible, but are actually very remote. Once you ski away from a road or a, a path junction, you can end up a long, long way from civilization. And if you've broken a ski or binding on a board or whatever, it's going to be quite an arduous trip to get back out again. So having some form of simple repair kit and a bit of creativity, hopefully a friend who's quite a good engineer, that's usually a good thing. Like I said, the, the, the challenge of the Scottish backcountry is one of survival. I suffer with cold hands. The weather in Scotland can go from very warm and pleasant to very cold and horrendous very quickly. So I definitely want to look after my extremities. I want to make sure that both my feet and hands are as warm as they can be. I have plenty of spare gloves because they get wet. There is no such thing as waterproof kit in Scotland. Somewhere the weather will find a way to get in. So belay jackets, synthetic materials that work in all climates are really good. And as well as having all that kit, it's really important to take enough food and drink with you. Can't underestimate how much effort skinning is and how much effort traveling in the back country is. So keeping yourself topped up with food and hydrated is vital that you can do that efficiently and travel well. And I don't know whether we have a, a, a question on that. As I said, you know, gear and what to pack is a personal opinion and everybody has a different opinion. So, like I said, this could be a very quick topic or we could spend the rest of the night going over and over kit. Are there well, any questions in there, Leslie? Um, there's a question around, uh, um, is your bag a Mary Poppins bag? But I, I'm curious, what, what volume would you say you need to take? Um, what volume is your backpack? Um, I have a, a the rucksack that was in the picture is 30 litres. And I think the key to taking enough kit on the hill is to be a very good packer. So yes, you can have a Mary Poppins bag that just empties kit out endlessly, or you can just learn how to pack the bag in a logical sequence that absorbs kit and its volume, but also is accessible for when you need it in a quick in a hurry. So little things like taking the ski crampons, I put my first aid kit in between my ski crampons because that dead volume that they create is impossible to manage. 
I take all the little bits of repair kit and I stuff that into all the little pockets that, uh, that come on these rucksacks that are unnecessary. And then I shove like I'm trying to push an elephant into a mouse hole. It's just about packing efficiently and shoving. What's in I, your repair kit? In my repair kit, if I, um, I'm gonna try and go back, if I don't know if that works. No, I can only go forwards. Oh, there we go. In the middle of that, that picture, my repair kit is lots of rubber straps. The, I don't want to use a manufacturer's name, but Black Diamond make them and they sell them. They're rubberized straps that you can use to attach a pair of skis together. But you can also strap them around a boot when you snap a buckle off. Keep the boot in, water, in ski mode when you need to skins that get wet and soggy because of our very wet and, and, and moist snowpack, when they lose the glue, you can strap them onto the bottom of the board or the ski with a couple of those rubber straps. I will always have some form of screwdriver tool, maybe a pair of pliers or whatever, just so that I can adjust bindings or tighten bindings up or get a rock and hit them with something. I'll often carry lots of little bits of thin string because you can fix almost anything with thin string, whether it's somebody's zipper, a jacket, whatever. You can repair a boot. You can repair a binding with all sorts of bits and bobs. Gaffer tape. I don't wrap gaffer tape around my ski poles, which you'll see a lot of people do because the weather gets to it and it loses its stick. So I have my gaffer tape on a little bit of plastic card. I have to confession, they're actually the door cards to the lodge that I steal and wrap, wrap tape around. Um, so then I guess the only other bit, the little pink bag there has got a tiny bit of, of wax in that I can use if my ski start stops sliding well, or more importantly, if, to, if my skin starts to ball up with snow. So if the skin gets wet and then you put it into cold, fresh snow, the snow sticks to it and that's the game over. So a little bit of wax on there will make that work. Um, zip ties are really handy, more probably for splitboard binding emergencies than ski touring equipment. But I would never be without a few zip ties in my backpack and they've rescued me numerous occasions when I've been many miles from home and I've had a binding malfunction. Um, we've got another question about thoughts on hiking in regular climbing gear and then changing to to ride or hiking in your your um, actual riding boots. Um, certainly um, I always take a spare thermal as well and quite often I'll, if I've had a big long hike I'll change my first layer if it gets wet and that's again that's if you're on a long day that I would say that's a good tip that works for me to keep me warm Andy what's your thoughts on changing gear um yeah I mean yeah I do that I do that occasionally um I also just try to vent and you know be bold start cold if you set off nice and cool and you don't if you start to heat up then you need to vent, change your layering, do whatever. I think one of the key things in Scotland is to be bothered to actually look after yourself, especially when the weather's horrendous and it's closed in, your hood is up, your goggles are on. You just can't be bothered to add another layer or take a layer off. But if, if you are, then you just look after yourself. If you're hiking in, if, if you look into hiking normal ski boots, you can get ski touring bindings that will uh, accept alpine boots. Um, I certainly did that when I started. My kids have all been introduced to um, ski touring in actual their, their race boots, and we just undo them as much as possible. And because you don't have the backward motion on, on the touring boot, on the alpine boots, they'll need to use the heel raises on the skis a little bit earlier. And it just makes them look like they're about to fall forwards into the snow. 
but it works quite quite effectively. Um, you can certainly hike up in hiking boots, carrying ski kit and uh, ski boots and change them. In spring, I'll often walk in in trainers. And if I'm coming back to that point, I'll stash the trainers and mark them on the G mark that point on the GPS. Um, if you are walking in with your boots, then um, they're not as hard, not as easy to get hold of now, but Tesco carrier bags around the top of the boot to make sure that the rain and snow doesn't blow into the liner, that makes a massive difference. And that's about, what I think that's all my top tips. James is asking about hiking in um, crampon compatible walking boots and changing into snowboard boots. And um, I think that's a good point because some snowboard boots are, can be slippy and not that epic to climb up slippy rocks in. Um, there are some great splitboard boots, boots on the market these days that have a crampon compatible sole and Vibram and great grips and all the rest of it. If you're able to get hold of them, then that's a, a good alternative. They are very, very, or they're much better than standard snowboard boots to go hiking around in. But otherwise, you know, you're, you're making a good point. If you're going somewhere that involves um, technical scrambling, then standard snowboard boots are are sometimes not that good for that and um, but yeah I think you're getting into technical terrain then any idea how to check if snowboard boots are cr crampon compatible and um, give them a shot I have put crampons on snowboard boots that are not officially crampon compatible and it has worked um, but also sometimes it hasn't that James sorry we, we're not being um too specific there but have you tried it with your snowboard boots have you tried putting on the crampons give it a shot cool right Andy um shall we crack on your next section yeah we've answered all the questions so far good good so navigation skills um when I was a when I was a trainee guide the um we did a day, or we did a weekend actually, with a French avalanche expert called Alain Duclos. And his three top, his three things to stay safe in the mountains was navigation, navigation, and navigation. It is, it, it, we're going to shoot through this section because there's a lot to talk about later on in the talk, but navigation is going to become a common thread. And it, it is really, really important. Um, on beautiful days like this, navigation is easy. You are hardwired to navigate in the in the wilderness. We're hunter gatherers, so we're we're destined, you know, we're programmed to go out into the into the wilderness, find our way around, and remember features and landmarks that will guide us home. And when we're so when we're navigating like in this sort of this sort of weather and these conditions big features, big landmarks, the macro type of navigation is what we're going to use. And it's really, really easy. When we want to have a little bit more detail, look a little bit more specifically to, to find an exact location, we would then use the micro features, the tiny little details on, that are on the map or on the ground. In winter, those micro features disappear under snow. So you can't see stream junctions, you can't see the streams. And when the weather closes in, navigation becomes much, much more challenging. So practicing in the summer, orienteering, good summer hill walking navigation is the perfect foundation for winter. And then when you come into this winter environment, we're gonna make things more challenging because we're going to put boards on our feet, we're going to put skis on, and we're going to slide. In summer, we measure our travel by controlling distance and speed. In winter, we struggle to measure our distance because we travel so much quicker over the snow. So for, you know, so our, our compass will give us direction, we have to use other tools to measure the distance and the time that that takes. 
And one of those tools, the key tools is an altimeter. meter. Um, now, obviously, if you want to pose down the pub, a massive altimeter watch is an essential posing tool for any pub poser. But they are incredibly cheap, they are incredibly available, and they're incredibly accurate. So it works perfectly for what we're going to do in the mountains. Now, they work off atmospheric pressure and in, in our environment, being so close to the sea, our pressure goes up and down all the time. So they, they will not be as accurate as an alpine or continental climate. But what they can do is you can reset them so that, for instance, if we're going to ski from A to B, we can't travel to that direct because boarding across or, or riding across a full line is unpleasant. We want to go straight down the hill to get the most even turns. So we're going to not go straight to B, we're going to go down the hill and then we're going to traverse in at the height of the coal that marks our, our exit. So 245 metres at the summit, I set my watch to zero. I knew that my descent was going to be 600 metres or 500 metres. I'm about halfway through, so X marks the spot. Now, if that was closed in and I couldn't see, I wouldn't know exactly on that contour where I was, but I would know at what, at what altitude or what height I was at and what the ground would be doing in front of me. When it comes to following a compass bearing on and sliding at the same time, when we walk, it's quite easy because it's nice and slow. When we're skinning, it's quite straightforward because you're generally going to skin in a straight line. But when we're riding, we're making turns and we're sliding. So it becomes much more, much more difficult. And as you see in the photo on the left, there's absolutely no visual reference there. How, on, how you keep the compass straight and turn at the same time is purely down to practice. I've just noticed a bubble in my compass there, and I'm embarrassed that my kit has a bubble in. I apologize for that. I never even realized that. One of the techniques we can use is to have somebody that is a visual reference. So for instance, um, I've sent my friend out in front. I line him up on the compass bearing. He can stop and I can ski nice turns to join him. And then I can either leapfrog ahead or he could carry on again. Using a bit of teamwork like that means I'm going to hold a much more accurate bearing. One of the other, another technique we can use is to use some sort of electronic assistance. And, and there's a huge amount available. And I've just got three examples here. So on the left, we've got a, a map from View Ranger, which is an app on my iPhone. And the G, using the GPS on your smartphone will position yourself on the map. Brilliant tool, very good. Um, you buy tiles for mapping as you need them, and you can have a, a, a range of maps from all over the world. It's, it's, it's a very useful tool. The middle picture is from FatMap, which uses a slightly uses the same technology. It's using the GPS on the smartphone, but it's putting you on a three-dimensional model. And one of the nice things about FatMap is you can turn on the layers, and it will give you an indication of the slope aspect that you stood on. So you can measure how steep the slope is while you're there. And then the third tool we have there, the right hand picture is a straightforward, I say straightforward, it's a handheld GPS. It's not straightforward. You need to know how to use that, but it will, you can program routes into them. Uh, you can mark waypoints, it will tell you where you are. And the new generation of um, handheld GPSs are also linked to the internet and you can signal and call for emergencies and, and talk to your friends. And your 
social media followers can track your progress during the day so they can see exactly where you are. A word of warning about all of this electronic gadgetry. Um, if you're using your phone, that is primarily, you should be carrying that as your emergency tool. That is your call for help. And if you use it for your navigation, then that would deplete the battery and diminish its ability to work as, a, a, as an emergency tool. And also, all of these electronic gadgetry from cameras to smartphones to GoPros to GPS, all of that electronic equipment that we carry and we like to have in our pockets interferes with the transmission and receiving of our avalanche transceivers. So the current thinking with anything electronic is to keep that 50 centimeters from your transceiver. So if you wear your transceiver on a holster on your chest, the best place for your smartphone is in your rucksack. Having it switched off or on makes no difference because it's the magnets within these devices that cause the main problem. We'll go for some questions. Um, would you take spare power for your phone? Would you speak a battery pack? Um, when I go touring in the Alps, or when I used to go touring in the Alps, um, I would definitely take a power pack so that I can keep my phone charged up. Um, I find with my current smartphone, if I turn off all the apps, um, I get rid of, reduce its power, turn down the screen brightness and turn it into airplane mode or flight mode, then the battery lasts perfectly fine all day. Um, I don't generally use my phone an awful lot. I try to keep that for a minimum. However, I, I do quite like the ease of using View Ranger to navigate. So I'm using it a little bit more, but I haven't had any problems with, with power as, as yet. And um, if you're comparing some of the, the different brands or for example, Garmin, Suunto, um, in terms of altimeters and other features, do you have a, any um, recommendations or comparisons that you can highlight? Um, I think you've got its personal choice. Choose the one that you like the look of. You're going to want to wear it. Um, I, you'll see people will wear their their altimeters on the outside of their, their jackets, on their rucksack straps or wherever. Uh, I spent too much money on my watch to do to smash it around on Cairngorm granite. So I wear it underneath my cuff. Um, I think they're all incredibly functional and good bits of kit. And it's really choose the one that you like and the one that you're going to feel comfortable wearing and the one that you're therefore going to take with you every day regardless. If you have um, lurking in your cupboard an old uh, analog altimeter, a handheld one like a thermometer, then use that because they are very good and incredibly accurate and they don't require batteries. In terms of functions that are most useful for um, splitboard and ski touring, do you have a top few? and on these tech devices? Absolutely. My, uh, my personal favorite is the handheld GPS. And of, often in Scotland, we're linking patches of snow together. And as you skin up through the, you're plotting your descent, I like to mark the top and bottom of the snow patches in my GPS so that when I get to the top and the weather's closed in, I can find the top of each of the good ski pack, snow patches to link up and the GPS will take me to the bottom to link me into the next patch. So I quite like that. Um, I really like the, um, the, the simplicity of view ranger. And I find that if I can mark my position really quickly, I can then use my existing map and compass to do the day-to-day -day nav between position fixes. 
So I tend to use my phone or view range just to position fix. And I really like fat map because I can see what the slope angle is ahead of me. So when I'm in working in a whiteout, it's really good to just flip the, the angles on and I can see how steep the slope is in front of me. Scotland is a very undulating and varied terrain. So being able to avoid those small little convexities is really useful. And I do that with fat map. Um, so um, there's some people saying they've used Garmin, different kinds and Sunto different kinds and have, you know, recommending and comparing. I think from your summary there, it's very much about researching what you want personally and, and, and what you're going to be happy with. But um, yeah, I guess the question from me is still being able to use the map and the compass and being able to navigate in flat light within map, map and the compass, if that's all you've got is step one, I, I would um, imagine. Oh, absolutely. Map, navigating with map and compass is what all these devices are based on. They're still navigating tools, and it's how we use all the tools at our disposal to do it efficiently. So if, you, if you're a tech-savvy tourer, then you're going to use tech. If, like me, you prefer little bits of paper stuffed in your pockets that are, are, are waterproof maps, then that's what I use, and I find ways to add, the tech, add value through technology. All of it should be robust, and you should also consider what happens when your hands are cold and you drop that expensive Garmin in reach or you have a tumble and you smash it, how are you going to deal with it? There needs to be redundant backup within your planning and your kit. And I'm afraid Map and Compass is still by far and away the best there is. Awesome. So I'm just aware of time. So um, yeah. I think we've answered most questions. So thank you. That was really interesting. Next. Section. Good. So we'll, we'll blast through some off-piste snow sport skills. So this is what we're after. Apologies to the snowboarders. Just imagine that it's, it's one board and you're slightly sideways. Beautiful blue skies, perfect snow. Uh, this is definitely still Scotland. This is what we want. Just travel in the Scottish mountains. We need a good skill set. Whether you're riding a board or riding two skis or whatever, you need to be proficient. And partly our safety is going to come from our ability to adapt to the changing visibility, the changing snow, the bad weather, how fatigued we are. All of that comes into it. So the better you are as a skier, the safer it is. We don't have oodles of deep powder to fall over in. And I wouldn't recommend falling over too often in Scotland. We need to be able to adapt our conditions. So whether you're, whether you're skiing nice, uniform, wide slopes like the guy on the right, or you're going to ski narrow, confined, steep, icy gullies like the, like the skier on the left, you need to have practiced and developed the skill set around that. And while we're talking about going down, we've got to be looking at the hazards ahead of us. So the guy on the left is definitely looking at, at potentially a very nasty place to make a mistake. The guy on the right has a greater, can take a bit more risk because he's on a wider, more open slope with less hazards. Don't just focus on the down. Having skills to go up is just as important. In Scotland, skin tracks, we have the choice to set a skin track that is shallow and meanders and works its way through the terrain rather than confronts the terrain straight on. I always used to say that you, very rarely do you need to use the heel raisers on your ski touring or snowboard touring bindings. You can find another way around it. So setting a track for efficiency and travel is important. But we do need to be proficient. Whether we're traveling uphill, we will still have to endure the, the dreaded kick turn. 
and practicing that, especially when the snow is hard or icy or refrozen, is really important. And we also need to be proficient to travel on foot. And just to make that more complicated, we need to be proficient at taking our boards and skis off on a slope, putting on our crampons, getting our axe out, putting the board or skis on the rucksack and transitioning back the way as well. Because that's something that happens quite a lot in Scotland. You can find that you go from being on your board or your skis to being on foot, to being back on your boards and skis a lot. So being well practiced and proficient and all of that sort of stuff is important. And if we jump to that, I know that's paid lip service to the off-piece skills, but there is more to come. And I'm just conscious of time and whether we can bump onto the next topic. Um, I think we've got a question about, um, or we've got a question about advice if you hate conditions or terrain, you don't feel confident you can manage, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you're gonna cover that in the next sections. So maybe we should just crack on and, and um, see where we get to. Absolutely. I will, if we don't answer that in the next sections, then we'll definitely come back to that at the end. Excellent. Right. So choosing the line in ascent and descent. This is, um, we're going to go through this. We're not going to go through this as quickly as some of the other areas, but there is a big subject. And the following two webinars that Mark Diggins is going to deliver will also come back to a lot of this. Now, in Scotland, we talk an awful lot about being avalanche aware. This is the uh, process which it was sort of founded by the Scottish Avalanche Foundation uh, for Snow and Science, I think, SAFOS, and the, avalanche, the Scottish Avalanche Information Service. And it's a process. Avalanches are real hazards in Scotland. Um, the numbers of avalanches triggered by snowboarders and skiers is going up year on year. So the process here is applicable. However, the process that, that we're going to talk about is very logical and it's very simple and, and you're already all doing it. You might not be just doing it in this cognitive process that we're going to show you. So how does being avalanche aware work? And this is what, how are you going to start off? You're going to consider three really important factors. And when you mix them together, that is going to become the basis for your decision making. So obviously, we're going to start with the avalanche hazard, the weather and the conditions on the mountains as they are now. We have to consider yourself and the people that you're going to go touring with. This, their skills, their experience, their well-being, how, whether they're sleepy, hungover, ill, all of the distracted because they're having a, a midlife crisis, all of that is going to have relevance to your decisions. And finally, you're going to consider the landscape that you're going into. What is your itinerary? What, what is the plan for the day? Are you going into some easy terrain? Are you going on a long journey traveling through the mountains? Are you going to a summit? Are you going to go and try and find some challenging, steep Scottish skiing or boarding? And we take those three subjects and we look at them in three very specific stages. The planning, that happens at home. And it happens in the weeks, the days and the hours before you even set out. So add to your daily routine, looking at detail at the weather forecasts. Look at the avalanche forecast that the, avalanche, the Scottish Avalanche Service puts out. Look at what the, the weather is saying from three or two or three different sources. Don't just use one favoured forecast. Try to get a balanced opinion. And you look at, when you're at home and you're planning, you're looking at the avalanche, you're looking at the human element, and you're looking at the terrain. And that green box should be about 75% of all this effort should be done at home. 
once you've made your plan and you set off on your journey, you're going to see how your plan fits with the landscape and the environment and the conditions that you're seeing. Is the avalanche conditions what you expected them to be? Is there more snow, less snow, more wind, more rain, more ice, whatever? Is the person you're, ski you're touring with, are they not, not cooperative, grumpy? Are they overexcited? Are they a bit too enthusiastic? Are they slightly uncontrollable? And is the mountains that you're going into, are they changing? Are they, is the plan the same? And this on the journey stage, that should be approximately 20% of your time. And finally, when you were planning, you will have identified key places where you have to make a decision to continue with plan A or continue or change to plan B or change to plan C, or even just abandon and go home. So when we're looking at these weather forecasts, we're looking at the, the meteorological information. What is going to be, what is, how much snow? What is the weather? How strong is the wind? Temperatures, things that will affect you. You're going to look at, look at the avalanche information. Now, as a service, we know that 70% of our, the views to the Scottish Avalanche Information website go straight to the blog but they should be going to the information on the forecast because the devil is in the detail and that's in the writing and this graphical demonstration of how the mountain, how the slope and snow is affected by the, by the, by the avalanche hazard. You can also gather information from other sources. So social media, you could go to guidebooks, the, Ski Mountaineering in Scotland book, the SMC guidebook, was published in 1987. So culturally, things have changed a lot. We don't tour on Nordic uh, misery sticks like we used to. We have proper skis that are fun for skiing. You have Kenny Biggin's guidebooks that will show you that how exciting and amazing things are and give you a lot of useful information. And how much trust and faith do we put into social media? Once we've gathered all that information, the next stage is to look at a map. And when we're choosing our ascent routes and our descents, it's the map that is the most important part. And you're going to take that avalanche information and apply it to the map. So looking at the compass rows and looking at the map, if you've got, if you're inclined, colour in the sections and the aspects that are hazardous. Or, or dangerous and should be avoided. And just by doing that simple task, you will clearly identify the slopes that we don't want to descend and the routes through those dangerous areas that we should be ascending. We need to look at the map in more than just a cursory glance. We need to get some proper detail. So if we're looking at either of these slopes, we've got Lurch's Gully on the right, and you've got a, a slope in Craig Meggie uh, off Stob Point Corrier there. And we want to know how steep they are. Now we can tell that they're steep. The one on the left is steeper than the one on the right because the contours are closer together. But if we measure the gap between the index contours, it can tell us exactly how steep things are. Now, from an avalanche point of view, the steeper you go, the more likely the risk is of triggering an avalanche. So often it's better to stay on shallow slopes. From an ability point of view, the steeper you go, the more able you need to be as a skier or a boarder. So being able to find routes that are appropriate to both the avalanche conditions and your ability and your ambitions is really important. And then when we head off, we get, we get in the car, we travel, we meet the other person that we're currently allowed to go touring with. We go out on our journey. Your eyes need to be open. Get into the habit of kicking, poking, stamping and looking at the snow. Don't dig pits. They take too long to dig. But get your avalanche probe out, poke the snow, poke it with your pole, pick up little bits. How is it behaving? 
Is it behaving the way you expected it to? And if you see things on the way, like you've got Alex here who's looking at, at a piece of snow that he wasn't expecting to see, or he's looking down a slope to try to get some more information, that will all feed into this decision that you're going to have to make at the key place. The two guys on the right, they're about to commit to this slope in front. They're trying to decide whether to carry on skinning, should they change to boots and crampons, or should they turn around because conditions are not what they expected. It might be icier, it might be more snow, it might be breakable wind slab that's causing them some concern. You'll also get points here where you have to decide to go or not to go. So when you stood at the top of that line, is it what you expected? You have to be honest to yourself. Did you set too fast a pace on the way up? Are you more tired, exhausted, sweaty, lacking concentration that you need? Are you worried about the car's MOT? Are you totally focused and committed to that descent? If you can't control all your anxieties and concentrate completely on what you're about to do, then perhaps the obvious decision is to turn around and wait for a better day. If there's any doubt with yourself or anybody in the group, then the sensible decision is to go back the way you came or choose an alternative descent that's less demanding on your skill set. And I'll stop there because I know that's quite a lot of information. And I'm sure there might be some questions about that one. Um, so I think you've answered um, or um, you've put together a really nice answer to the question. What's the advice if you hit snow conditions or terrain you don't feel confident you can manage uh, in relation to um, the first step is, um, is in the planning process, if um, if I'm understanding you correctly there. Um, I think it's perhaps more than just the snow conditions or terrain that you don't feel you can manage though. So, um, I really like the, the way you've got the, the three elements and the three different areas as well and how they combine. So, you know, if all of a sudden you can't manage yourself or your touring partners or your whatever, that, that's also a perfectly valid reason for going back to your planning process and about turning and uh, going back the way you came or going on plan B. Um, and that's something I've definitely done a lot of times in, in the past myself. You get somewhere you're just not up for it anymore or you're more tired or you're more cold or your equipment's not working or the snow's different and you just have to backtrack and, and definitely no shame in that. Um, we don't does anybody, I don't have anything in the chat box, does anybody have anything specific they want to ask about the way those elements are combined? Does that help to imagine them in those different, um, the three different elements and areas and how they combine, does that help? We'll leave people to, to get on with the chat and in the meantime, Andy, um, have you got any stories about turning back? Well, Yes, I mean, I've obviously got stories about when I wished I had turned back. But, you know, we live the snowy mountains, whether they be in Scotland or the Alps, they're a very wicked learning environment. They're not they're not a kind and forgiving place. When it goes wrong, it goes wrong very badly. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't tell us when we've made a mistake and we've got away with it. And often getting away with it gives us these false positives that we then lead us to believe that we're actually quite good at what we do. And unfortunately, the only way to avoid those false positives is to make good decisions from the beginning. But you can't quantify good decisions till you've experienced the product of some bad decisions. So you have to go and have an experience and that's why it, that's why the mountains are a wicked learning environment the key things are to be true to your planning so when you set off if you planned to ski 
the east face of a slope because that fits with the weather, the avalanche conditions and the personal and group aspirations that you have. And as you ski in, you see somebody ripping some nice turns down the west side, which was highlighted on the avalanche report. You, you must be true to your planning. Just because they haven't triggered an avalanche doesn't mean what they're doing is right. What you were doing when you planned was right and you stick to your plan, it will be right. Being lured in by the mountain sirens or other people is not not a good way to go be true to your planning and you'll be true to yourself um i noticed um in your talk you said don't dig a pit it takes too much time but um, I, i'm gonna caveat that with if it's really terrible weather and you can't see anything and you can't really go to where you were gonna go the mists come in um it's sometimes quite an interesting way to spend some time if you've got that time to kill and certainly it's helped me over time to understand the, the layers in the snowpack and how, how they change and how the, the different layers within the snowpack can be so hugely different from one another. So I think if you've not done it before and you end up inevitably, as you will in Scotland, caught in the mist kind of not that far from your starting point, then, then getting, um, getting into it and just giving it a shot, digging a pit, having a look at the snow crystals, and really trying to understand what it is you're seeing. So, because obviously what you look for is what you're gonna see and that's gonna help your understanding. And personally, I find that interesting. Always remember to fill your pit back in and always dig it in a secure place. <laughs> Absolutely, you know, poking around, digging on a slope that is of a similar aspect and elevation to the one that you go, you want to, ski or board is always useful information and you know i would say time spent digging is not wasted unless it makes you late for something that you, or or you miss the opportunity or the weather window um but you should never base your decision on a pit because it's it, a pit is pure information that is all it will give you it will help you in and inform you to make a decision, but don't base your decision solely on the evidence of what you see in the snow. The more you dig, the more you poke, the better you'll get at, at, at getting to feel what's going on. Colour is really important. Texture is really important. So we're gifted with these senses, and I suppose all but smell and taste are relevant to of avalanche avoidance and picking a good line. You know, just looking at this picture in front, you can see the vast range of colors that the snow has from white to gray, to being illuminated by the sun, how dense it is. All of that is information that's, that's useful to you. You might see avalanche debris. We get a lot of natural avalanches in Scotland when cornices collapse or slopes get overweighted and trigger themselves. If you see fresh avalanche debris, that's like, that's a bullseye to tell you that you shouldn't, you shouldn't go on those slopes. We'll also see a lot of old debris in Scotland. And the, the, I suppose one of the challenges we have in Scotland is it changes from one minute to the next. It's such a rapid metamorphic trans, transition within the snowpack that it's almost hard to keep up to date with it. The wind, you know, for instance, the day this photo was taken, you couldn't ski this slope in the morning because it was patchy and bare. Two hours later, it's got five, six inches of windblown powder on. And it was one of the best skis of, of that season. But it wasn't there four hours before. Wow. So be, keeping your eyes open and looking around is, is really vital. We've got a uh, question from Ben. Is taking calculated risks part of learning stroke improving? And what's the balance? And um, I've got a really nice little story here. Um, I was lucky enough to go touring in um, Wyoming with um, a, a legendary mountaineer, I guess, called David Agnew. And he's in his 70s and he goes out ski touring 
for hours for you know 120 days of the season and has done for um, you know since the 50s and I asked him the same question you know how how do you calculate your risks and he brought the personal element very much to the fore so he obviously knows the snowpack he knows the avalanche forecast he's paying attention to all the signs all the time but he he definitely used a today's the day that I will take that that level of risk and he put a percentage on it so the the per, the specific slope had been you know it was a certain aspect had been in the sun for um, a specific amount of time that day and was um, uh, behaving to you know the conditions that he knew about from the weather forecast and the avalanche forecast and he had made an assessment and that on that day it was what well, he put a percent let's say 10 percent dangerous and on that day for him, that was too high a percentage. So he had this really specific calculation that he was making based on um, a really similar decision-making process. And this is somebody who's been at it his whole life, um, originally a, a climber, then a you know ski tourer in his very late years, he's still going strong. Um, and many has lost many friends in the mountains and, and has managed to um, stay in one piece and have lots of great experiences. So there you go. I, I would say that developing that balance through knowing yourself and paying attention to all the elements, it, it bodes well. <laughs> Absolutely. I think if you, if you talk to Avalanche, uh, people that are caught in avalanches, then what they're surprised at is the speed, ferocity, size, all the elements that, of the avalanche. They're not surprised at the fact that it actually avalanche because that was a risk that they were prepared to take. But it's the size and, and how vicious the avalanche is that takes them by surprise. Should we, should we move on to the last one? Because we are overrunning a bit. Yeah. Cool. So managing the ascent and descent. Um, this is the good stuff because if we do this, we do the planning correct and we do this bit correct, we're going to have a lifelong, a life filled with num huge numbers of ski touring descents and, and such adventure and excitement that when we're old and grey, we look back on our life with great, great fondness. That's my plan anyway. Um, so plans. Um, you've done your planning stage, you've done your observation stage and you, you've got your key places picked out. The communication of that within the group is important. So we're going to make a plan. We're going to follow the plan we're not going to be tempted to deviate from the plan unless we have evidence to do so. So if we have, you know, if you haven't considered it, you should avoid it. So, but the communication is important and that's the, that's the key to this. One of the, um, one of the, the big buzz topics within risk management is checklists and how such a simple thing as writing down a checklist takes away any element or emotion that you shouldn't have. So when you set off with your group, whether there's a, des a designated leader or somebody that's got more experience or you're all equal, then you should discuss that plan. Go to the point of, of writing down what you're going to do and stick to it. If you change from that is when that's when the problems will arise. You have to make a decision whether you're going to, in your ascent, is whether you're going to travel on skin or whether you're going to travel on foot. Um, the, the, the team on the left are skinning quite a steep slope. And I mean, I know I was there. It was a lot more preferable to skin because it was slight, quite icy underneath that very thin veneer of soft snow. And if you tried to travel that on boot, you just slipped away. If you tried 
to traverse and make zigzags, you broke through the thin veneer of snow onto the ice below. So sticking the heel raises up and going straight up the hill was the obvious choice. We could say that, that was poor planning or poor decision making on the hill, but there wasn't a lot of choice. So that was the best choice they had. The guy on the right has chosen to go to boot. Now, probably the slope angles are not that different, but almost certainly in the conditions for the chap on the right, boot packing is going to be a lot more preferable. In Scotland, we don't have huge ups and we don't have huge depths of snow that we'd often be wading up to our waist. Although Cairngorm at the moment is very well, is covered in a lot of snow. And, and Leslie was saying she was up to her waist in it the other day when she took her board off. That's not normal conditions. So often we can, when the skinning becomes difficult, the boot pack become, can become a very good option for us. But the golden rule for everything we're making in ascent is that we should improve and not just don't destroy. If we're on a skin track, adding a little stamp in every now and then will improve the flatness of the skin track. It will improve how easy it is for the people behind us to follow. If we're on our boots and we're kicking in wearing crampons, we should be aiming to improve those steps. So the person at the front is doing a lot of hard work, but they can change over and somebody else can come through and do a bit of hard work. And all of that effort will help the group ascend safely and more efficiently. When we get to the top, the communication is important. If you're in a group or you're with, you might only be with somebody else, if they're ready to go and you're not ready to go because you feel like you need to have another quick cup of tea from the flask or you need to have another bar to give yourself a boost of energy or you just need to change your gloves, you need to speak up because everybody's always in a hurry to be as efficient and as quick as they can when they're in the mountains. And the reality is we just need to occasionally have a little bit more patience and wait. We need to communicate this plan so that we know what our tactic for the descent will be. And we need to make sure that everybody in that group knows what that tactic for the descent is going to be. Quite often that might involve going up quite close to somebody and shouting very loudly in their ear because it's so windy. It might be a case that you need to pre-decide this descent plan or you discuss it on the way up. When, you, when you're in the shelter of the wind. But once you go, you need to have decided whether you're going to have a bit of a send train and, and a fun experience of all, of all skiing or riding together, or do you need to go one at a time? When we ski all together, we put a huge load and strain into the snow that we're skiing on. We've got heather and bits of grass poking out of this snow here, and it's quite shallow. So a big group skiing together in that visibility is probably quite safe. If we can't see through visibility or we're concerned about the snowpack, then we need to make the decision to go one at a time and we make that decision carefully. If it's bad visibility, one at a time is not such a good idea because we will lose that visual communication that's vital in the event of an, an avalanche. We might decide that when we're entering the slope, we're going to use a rope. We should have no heroes on, on the mountain. Everybody should feel comfortable asking for a rope, using a rope. It might be that the first person uses the rope to get rid of the little wind lip or cornice or to check how good the slope actually is. I like to boot up the steep slopes that I'm going to ski, so I get all the information about the snow conditions before I actually commit to it. But if you don't have that and you're coming over, then a rope is really useful. 
having some form of visual reference is a technique that we're going to use a lot more in Scotland than we would elsewhere in the world. In the Alps, we very rarely, you know, if it's bad weather, we would ski in the trees. In Scotland, if it's if you wait for good weather, you'll never leave the house. So we get used to skiing in bad, bad visibility or low visibility. You can take it in turns to be the, 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 the skier at the front who is giving the guy behind a visual reference. They know how steep the slope is. They know what the snow is doing. We can also do this in a nice leapfrog way where a group can ski a pitch, stop, the next person can ski on, stop, and we end up with a nice whole, like a human slalom course to lead ourselves down that wide open slope that we can't see. Or you just take it in turns to be the, the punter at the front that feels like they can't, they, they, don't, they haven't a clue which way is up, they get all seasick and wobbly, but the guy behind is getting to see what's going on. And then when we have that visibility, it's important that we point out or identify those hazards. We look for the rocks, we look for the group in the gully that we're about to ski down on. We don't want to trigger an avalanche into that gully because we'll bury the group at the bottom. But we need to verbalize that information. We need to take a few seconds to point out to each other the hazard. Have you seen that rock? No, I didn't see that. I was adjusting my goggles. My goggles are steamed up. I can't see where I'm going. These little things, they might seem very obvious and almost a bit crass to, to highlight them but they're very, very important for making our riding as enjoyable and as safe as possible and giving it the flow so that we can travel through these mountains. For instance, it would make sense for these two skiers to carefully go slowly through these rocky patches before reaching the gully where they can open it up and accelerate and enjoy a more dynamic and exciting ski or ride. And I'll move on. That's any questions on, on, on the management of the terrain. I think we're, we're good. Oh, wait a minute. What do you do if you end up on a slope you have concerns about, or so you accidentally end up there? What do you do? So pretty challenging really. And, and it's very easy to, to be quite flippant and say, well, you shouldn't, and your planning should prevent that. But reality is that it will happen from time to time. If you're on a slope like that and you're concerned about the avalanche stability, then you need to make a lot of noise so that your colleagues and friends can watch you and they don't want to follow you either. So often if you're out of, out of vocal range, some sort of hands, agreed hand signal is really important. If you don't like it because of that, you need to try to change the slope you're on as quickly and as efficiently as you can. Be very aware of what is below you, because if there are cliffs, rocks, terrain traps below, then that's gonna be an area you don't wanna go into. You, there is no right or wrong thing to do. Get off that slope as quickly as you can. And usually that would be traverse pretty swiftly to get away, to change the aspect or to change the angle. Going up or straight down isn't always the answer. If you're on that slope and you don't want to be there because the snow is gone from being soft to hard, then Having an ice axe handy so that you can chip yourself a little ledge to stand on or quickly find a side step back up to get onto some softer stuff or just ski with a little bit more restraint so that you don't end up getting too far away from the good snow and ending up on the bad snow. Um, I, one of the reasons I like to have a rope with me is if I'm in that situation, I can call for a rope. Somebody can just quickly throw me a rope and give me a hand line that I can use to either 
help myself up or support myself while I take off my board or my skis. Um, hopefully it doesn't happen very often. And if it does, it's only a small slope as opposed to a big slope. If you're on a big slope and you're in that situation, I'm afraid you're gonna to have to squeeze your poles a bit tighter and, and, and suck it up. If it's a small slope, then you should be able to find a position that you feel more comfortable on or is a better, more suitable area. Well, does, that, does that help? Yeah, yeah. What rope length do you carry? Um, as a, 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 a Scottish rope, I tend to have about 30 metres of rope and, and reasonably thin. We're not, we're not using this rope for climbing, so we don't need a big, thick, heavy climbing rope. A nice lightweight ski touring rope that's probably about eight millimeters in diameter, about 30 meters long. It's long enough to help you get out of trouble, but not long enough to get you into more trouble, if that makes sense. Um, and the rope work the, the, that we might encourage you to learn or, or practice is simple. There's nothing technical or complicated it's a rope that you can use as a hand line. It's a rope that you can have tied around your waist to lower you over a cornice or whatever. I think of all the emergency rope work I've done in Scotland, it's been to help somebody out of a burn is where it's come into its own. We've been skiing down a burn. We've gone through, through the freezing level and one of my colleagues, fell into the burn and was half in, half out, trapped so they couldn't actually get themselves out, but had a spare hand. We were able to throw them a rope and pull them clear of, of, of the river that was raging underneath. And I guess that's one of those little unique hazards we have in Scotland is, is the water hazard underneath the snow. But that's predominantly all I've ever used a rope for. Um, I've got a question, a, a split board question. Do you find terrain and snow conditions you would ride on a solid board eliminated, eliminated by the floppies of the split? Um, you, a lot of the time, I would say perhaps, although split boards are getting better and I, I've got a new split board um, that's way better than the, the boards, the split boards, the first generation, maybe seven, eight, nine years ago that does handle um, more technical terrain without flopping out on me. Um, a tip is to blunten off your inside edges so that when you put your split board together, those edges are not catching. Make sure your clips are working. Sharpen your outside edges. You don't want to be in Scotland without an edge that you can't rely on because very often you're going to go into something and it, it is likely to have icy patches, if not be icy. If you are going into steep terrain on your split board, you must have edges. And I'd never go anywhere without crampons either. You can get away with a lot more on skis in Scotland than you can um, on a snowboard when it comes to the icy conditions. So snowboards in general are not, not as solid on ice and split boards are not as solid, I would say, as a, a non-split snowboard. So make sure the ice tools on your snowboard, the edges and the crampons are in good working order and that'll help forward lean on your bindings. You can't ride on icy conditions without a good amount of forward lean on your bindings either. So all those little tweaks to the equipment, your stance, narrow the stance. I would, I ride a less freestyle stance if, on my split board than I do on my normal snowboard. I've got more angle on my front foot and I'm zero angle on my back foot where I would have duck foot on my back foot um, or negative minus angles on my back foot normally and um, so those little things can make a big difference to how stable your board performs in variable snow conditions and um, then we've got a, a question about why in Scotland is the best snow normally in the most hazardous areas of the avalanche rose love that it's described as a rose um because because it's windy, because we're surrounded by the sea, um, we get a lot of wind, and unfortunately, that is the nature of the beast. 
the there is no easy way around that however if you think of the early winter months as the build up to the best ski touring snowboard touring riding to conditions which are end of winter so during those early winter months the wind is busy filling in all those gullies the nooks and crannies the 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 amazing terrain that we have in the high mountains, the gully systems. And then when that snow is transformed into nice spring snow, that's when it's perfect. So the wind is our friend. It is also, yes, it is a pain in the neck because it will load up the wrong slopes when we want them. But I'm afraid that is just a little bit of patience and humility. The mountains have been there for millions, billions of years. We won't be. So you have to just be patient to wait for the right conditions. We don't often get snowfall without wind. So we have to work with it, I'm afraid. Um, you can always look to reduce the angle and that will give you a bigger safety margin, but it won't eliminate the risk entirely. And then the picture here, um, the slope looks a little bit concave. Um, and you mentioned that uh, there was some wind loading over time. How did you assess the risk before skiing it? So this is one we come back to the, the senses. How does that snow feel? Um, if you look at the stuff that's coming off the skis, it's coming off more powdery than slab. Slab would come off as lumps, big chunks. And windblown powder is on its way to becoming a wind slab, but it's not there yet. So as an element of timing that works for, for this slope, it was also the consistency that we were able to have and the knowledge that underneath was a much harder, older layer of fairly well transformed and consolidated snow. So this was, it looks more impressive than it actually is. It was, as, as so often is in Scotland, a little bit was going an awful long way. I hope that answers that one. Yeah, no, thanks, Andy. That, those are the questions for now. I think we're, we're good. Excellent. Well. Oh, we can't hear you, Andy. You've gone on mute, Andy. Special skills. These are my special <laughs> webinar skills that I've developed. I've managed to mute myself without touching anything. Um, that's that was all the topics that um, that I was going to cover. Uh, I apologise profusely for overrunning, but I hope that information has been useful. I hope you've enjoyed yourselves. Um, I guess I need to thank Ian and Leslie for helping me with tonight. And I look forward to some more skiing, riding this winter, and hopefully seeing a few of you out on the hill from a social distance, obviously. Thanks, Andy. We've got, we're getting some questions in here. Um, what I'll, I'll maybe do, Ian, if, if you could take a note of the questions people are asking for, advice on avalanche bags and guidebooks and maybe that's something that um we could cover through snow sports scotland in some way and point you know point signpost people to different options um, and yeah, abso uh, uh, absolutely leslie we will record the we have a recording of the chat we have a recording of the session um we'll make sure that goes out to all those who couldn't get in on this session this evening as soon as possible but absolutely, if you'd like to, as you are doing, just put your thanks in the comments there. We'll share that with everyone after the session as well. And, uh, and if you wouldn't mind, just jump onto the very last slide as we say thanks to everybody. Just remind everyone that coming up um, next Friday, that's Friday the 15th at seven o'clock, Mark Diggin will be talking um, through the session that's known as Being Guided by Conditions, where he'll be bringing back in to the discussion the Being Avalanche or Be Avalanche Aware um, system and then that will be followed by the final session on the 21st of January which is a Thursday again at seven o'clock deeper understanding of the complexities 
Uh, and as I say, that's all Mark Diggin, Mountain Guide, Director of SAIS. So lots to come. But in the meantime, Leslie, thank you. Andy, thank you very much. Most informative, very enjoyable. Uh, and thanks very much for everyone for coming along. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.